Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, May 11th, 2017 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I'm Mayor David Narkowitz, the chair of the school committee. We'll begin the meeting by asking the clerk to call the roll. Present. 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 Here. Here. Present. Present. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll begin the meeting this evening, as we always always do, with a public comment period. So if there's folks wishing to speak uh, during the public comment period, you can step up to the podium and we allow you uh, three minutes. If you could please state your name and address for the record. Hello, my name is Julie Spencer Robinson. I live at 248 Spring Grove Avenue in Florence, and I am president of the Northampton Association of School Employees. Tonight, I would like to give you a short report on two labor management projects that Superintendent Provost and I are working on in the district. The first is a district team for the effective implementation of the district improvement plan, which is made up of nine association representatives um, who partner with the six principals and three other administrators to use a district and school leadership team structure that ensures effective prioritization and implementation of Northampton's DIP in ways that improve student learning. You may have seen the fish graphic that the superintendent set out, sent out with his DIP insider earlier this week, and that was a product of our committee's work. We think it's important for faculty to understand the DIP goals from year to year and see how we're progressing on each of them. I encourage you to take a close look at that graphic if you haven't already. Our monthly DIP meeting was last week, and the main focus of it was to use a school reform initiative's future protocol to map a path forward for the successful implementation of the district inclusion initiative. The superintendent and I co-chair those meetings, which involves a fair amount of preparation, and we receive support from former Massachusetts Deputy Commissioner of Education, Carla Baer, who now consults with the Rennie Center. The discussions we have at every meeting are honest, respectful, thoughtful, deep, and nuanced. I want to thank the association representatives who engage in this important work. Annette Bischoff, Holly Taylor, Michelle Andrews, Lori Sperry, Garrett Adams, Faith Bisbee, Holly Graham, Sue Crago, and Melissa Powers Green. I also want to thank district administrators for their unswerving commitment to this challenging but fruitful work, and especially Superintendent Provost for sharing my research-based conviction that labor management collaboration makes schools better places to work and to learn. Another project the superintendent and I are involved in is a teacher workforce, workforce diversity coalition, which seeks to build an ESP to teacher career ladder to support black and Latino ESPs who want to become teachers, with the goal of having our teaching force be more representative of our diverse student population. This coalition includes district and association representatives from Northampton, Amherst, Holyoke, and Springfield, coordinators of area teacher preparation programs, and representatives from the employment sector and community groups in the region. Because I'm a full-time release president, I'm able to represent Northampton on the steering committee of the coalition. My first task has been to put together a focus group of black and Latino ESPs who work in Northampton and Amherst to meet with a coalition researcher who seeks to identify barriers to these ESPs in becoming teachers. That group will meet on Monday, and the ESPs will receive compensation for their participation. I look forward to giving you updates on this critical work that I'm so glad we can be a part of. Thank you. <coughs> okay, is there anyone else who wishes to speak during public comment? Okay, seeing none, uh, we will now move on to announcements. Are there any announcements from members of the school committee? Ms. Fallon and Ms. Busanski. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone that um, we support our school's plant and garden market it's Saturday, this Saturday, May 13th from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. at Smith Vocational School. Um, there will be plants, flowers, vegetables, garden books, tools, etc. cetera. Uh, for sale, and um, all the proceeds from the sale go um, towards books for the Northampton Public Schools. Last year, over $10,000 was distributed to our students. So if you um, can support that, we would appreciate it. Ms. Busanski. 
Thanks. I just wanted to just give a little quick feedback on um, two events that I went to recently. One, um, and I have props for both. It's so much fun. <laughs> One is the Mass State Day on the Hill, which I attended with Elena Fragamini back at the end of April. And um, I think it was a great day. I think it's really important that we all stand up and be counted. And there are lots of folks from school committees all over the state. And, you know, first is a morning of learning. And then in the afternoon, we kind of flood the state house and get to talk to our representatives. And I think that was really important. So, you know, we went and talked to COCOT and Rosenberg's egg. Rosenberg was traveling, unfortunately, about the importance of the fair share tax so we could have more money for education, about fully funding the Foundation Budget Review Commission's recommendation and um, about some legislation that came up about onerous mandates that our teachers and administrators have to deal with that really impedes their, um, te their ability to teach and serve our students. Um, and, you know, we heard from Rosenberg's office all about his Kids First initiative, which I know was kind of officially launched at the beginning of May. Um, interestingly, after last year, all the charter school talk about charter school reform and legislation and the results of the uh, no on to and all of that, there just doesn't seem to be much appetite for any kind of charter school reform at this moment, which was a little disappointing to me. But, And then all of this is just kind of in light of the fact that we're not going to be collecting any new revenue. We know our tax revenue is down. April was worse than they expected. Um, so we're looking at a pretty, you know, harsh, another, yet another harsh budget season and everybody is holding out hope upon hope for this fair share tax which we know is not necessarily going to be an easy road to cross and there's a lot of political stuff going on about it um, so but we're all sort of trying to remain hopeful but all in all I think it was a good day and it was um, great that we got a chance to go do that the other thing I just wanted to mention briefly is I went to one of the best conferences I've been to in years the Holyoke Food Justice Conference Exhibit B, and um, <laughs> on Saturday, where uh, we talked about a lot of issues in terms of food justice on the micro and macro level, but um, most importantly, I think, to this group was really, um, it was kind of a reminder to me of the importance of school nutrition and about school food. And I think what's, um, what, you know, we all know that uh, for our, our low-income kids that this nutrition makes up a big part of their day, and it's really important that we are aware of and pay attention to what are we serving them. And I think we have so many of that piece, those pieces in place um, to really make um, great traction on this. We have a great food service director who we've already seen in his you know, short tenure here already, doing a lot of change and innovation. And we were talking earlier about you know, how much he is on board with all of this and what he's doing moving forward, which is great. We have great education about healthy food. We have four community gardens at our four elementary schools doing great work on it. And we also have, you know, in the high school, I know the wellness curriculum, the environmental sciences does a lot on healthy food, nutrition, et cetera. So we have a lot of pieces in place, but I think we could probably, we can even raise the bar higher and do more about getting better food, local healthy food into our schools. And I think we have like communities around us who are doing that work. Chicopee, um, Greenfield, and now Amherst has a brand new food services director who's very committed to this work as well, as well as our own food service director, which is really great. So just wanted to give a little shout out on that too. Mr. Reed. So also I wanted to mention that the SPED PAC Appreciation Awards are uh, May 31st from 6 to 8, and it's a change of venue this year. It's in the NHS library. So that's a great event. Okay. Um, and I was actually going to make a quick announcement tonight, um, and that is that um, f uh, tomorrow is Arts Night out in the city, um, but it also is arts uh, tying into that for the schools. Um, there is going to be here tomorrow uh, from 4 to 6 uh, a reception and for exhibition of student art um, grades K through 8. You probably saw some of it when you came in. Um, and then from 5 to 7 at the Hosmer Gallery at Forbes Library <coughs> is an exhibition of um, NHS student art. So all kind of tying in with Arts Night Out, which is happening at City Hall and all throughout the downtown. So um, just wanted to uh, let uh, the public know about all of our student artists that will be displaying tomorrow night at JFK and at Forbes Library. Any favorite artists? Uh, <laughs> I've, I've got a few. <laughs> One in particular, but yes. <laughs> Any other announcements? Okay, so we'll now move into recommended actions under the consent agenda. 
Uh, we have um, the approval of minutes of the Rules and Policy Subcommittee of May 4th, 2017. We have budget transfer approvals for facilities department budget transfers to purchase grounds and custodial equipment, special education budget transfers to cover special education budget shortfalls, technology budget transfers to purchase Chromebooks, and then we have two field trip requests, the NHS track team, New England Invitational, going to Norwell High School in Norwell, Mass, June 10, 2017, and then the NHS track teams going to the New Balance Outdoor Nationals in Greensboro, North Carolina, June 16th through the 18th of 2017. And I Motion to approve the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so the consent agenda is approved. The next item on the agenda is a report from our student representative, Elena Fragamini. Hi, everyone. Uh, happy May. Um, so seniors are headed towards their last days of school at NHS. Um, their last day of classes is May 30th. And um, heading towards the culmination of their education in our public schools, um, certain seniors will be presenting their capstone projects this coming week. Um, these projects range from throat singing to photography projects to making chocolate and a children's book about consent. So these are all um, really exciting projects and it's awesome that our students have had the ability to have an open period in their day and guidance from our school educators to do those independent projects. Um, some seniors chose to direct plays as their senior capstone project. This week, last week, NHS hosted a production of the play Accidental Death of an Anarchist. And next Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, there will be performances of The Tempest. Uh, last week was Pride Week at NHS. The Gender Sexuality Alliance played music by queer artists in the cafeteria, showed LGBTQ positive shows in the community room, and participated in the Pride Parade last Saturday. Um, moving on with this advocacy, the NHS Environmental Club participated in the Climate March in Washington, D.C. They wanted me to mention to you that they were featured in the official video of the Climate March. <laughs> they were really proud of that. <laughs> um, next week, they are sponsoring Bike Week, which will promote sustainable modes of transportation, and students who ride their bikes to school will get a free muffin. It's a pretty good incentive. <laughs> um, students at NHS are currently in the middle of taking AP exams. Um, anecdotally, many students are disappointed with the cost of these tests, as well as the fact that they are required. Um, and the student union is currently working on collecting data um, about, on students' opinions about the AP testing policies. And uh, we look forward to continue to work with the NHS administration on finding a way to work with these policies to benefit our students. And we are open to um, any feedback that you all may have um, or that any students or parents may have. Um, lastly, I want to thank the committee for the opportunity to attend the Massachusetts Association of School Committees Day on the Hill. A special thank you to Rebe Rebecca Buzanski for transporting me and for being an awesome partner on that Day on the Hill. I mean, it was really informative. It was my first trip to the Boston State House. So thank you to you guys for giving me that opportunity. <laughs> it was really fun, learned a lot, and I'm very grateful. So thank you. Thank you very much, Elena. The next item on the agenda is... Um, an introduction by Police Chief Jody Casper of uh, the new elementary school resource officer, Officer uh, Doug Dobson. So I'll turn it over to Chief Casper. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, thank you all for inviting us uh, both here. Um, I wanted to give you an overview of a new program that we've just uh, put out into the schools that the superintendent and I uh, have been talking about for the last few months and is now just a little bit underway and we wanted to give you a heads up on that and certainly answer any <coughs> questions that you may have if you should have any. Um, so essentially what we did is we have begun as school resource officer program for the elementary schools and before you get really excited and think that that means that it's going to be like Al St. Ange was or like Josh Wallace was, meaning that they were committed full time uh, to that position, um, Doug Dobson, who's in the back here, is the new elementary SRO, is not that. Uh, we simply don't have the staffing uh, to be able to do that. Uh, but what we do have is a very uh, kind hearted and willing officer who's willing to take on more tasks with no more pay. So basically, <laughs> Doug Dobson there in the back is going to retain his duties as a patrol officer. He currently is assigned to the day shift, um, but throughout his days he will make an effort to stop at each one of the different four elementary schools 
uh, and stay for somewhere around an hour to do a different activity that's determined by the school leaders. So uh, Doug has already made an effort to reach out to some of those school leaders and has those plans are just kind of evolving. We recognize it's the end of the year right now, so I think next year coming into it, it'll be a little different beginning in September where there may be a, you know, a larger introduction of, of uh, Officer Dobson into the schools. Um, but for now, our, our goal is to just have Officer Dobson finish out the year, uh, you know, start to meet some students, be a familiar face around the schools, be there for a resource. Um, if there are calls that come into the schools, be it, you know, a, a child who is in need of assistance, a child who's in crisis or some other incident, um, Officer Dobson would certainly be one of the first to be able to go to that. Uh, but our other officers can, of course, as well. But he'll be paired with Officer Wallace, who's assigned to the high school and the middle school. Uh, and they'll be, you know, attending conferences and trainings together. So there'll definitely be some cross-training, but to be very clear, uh, Officer Dobson is still a patrol officer and doing those duties. You may have seen his name in the paper recently because he's the person who identified the bank robbery suspect who, who he just uh, grabbed for us. So we're very fortunate to Doug for that. Uh, in addition to his rock-solid street skills, uh, he's also been a, um, he's been with the department since 1999, and that makes him particularly... Uh, well qualified for this position is that Doug originally wanted to be uh, an elementary school gym teacher so his education is actually in that. Uh, he then changed his mind, got further education in policing and criminal justice so he's dually trained to do both but the thing that makes him most qualified he has triplets. So uh, no one is more qualified than Doug to, to do this job. So he's certainly well qualified. Uh, I'll certainly be happy to answer any questions. I wanted to just have Doug, Doug come up and I wanted to say a few words about what he's done thus far. Any other words you may have, Doug? And I do have triplets. <laughs> I'm sweating. But I have met with the four principals of the elementary schools and we discussed some of the ideas of possibly getting there before school starts and greeting the kids before school, possibly in the lunchroom, and then out at recess, trying to more informal uh, connection with the kids so they can see a friend, another friendly face that, that wears a uniform. Does anyone have any questions for either Doug or I? How old are your triplets? <laughs> uh, they'll be 13 in June. <laughs> just wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just wondered, do you have any ideas about interaction with parents of elementary students in this role? Well, it is something that, I mean, the superintendent and I had talked about a number of different programs. This is one that I think we think it addressed the most amount of issues that were brought up, um, you know, in the springtime. So as far as talking to parents, certainly always open to that. If there were ideas that were brought forward, it's something we would consider. It's not particularly part of this plan. If okay. there was a school principal that wanted to invite uh, Doug to come to some particular event, I'm sure he'd be open to that. We're pretty flexible. Hi, uh, nice to meet you. So um, I talked to my student union a little bit about this, and they wanted to know if you would be um, carrying a gun when you were visiting the elementary schools. Uh, yes, I will be. It's, I'm a patrolman first. I need to be able to protect the school, protect the community. That's my role. Other question? Okay. No. Mr. Meyer, yes. Yeah, I just wonder about... Um, I know you've mentioned limitations of resources, but in addition to um, Officer Dobson's work and, and doing work within the schools, are there other things, other outreach efforts that you've discussed with the superintendent going forward? Um, other opportunities for the students to, if you know, if, it, if the officers can't get to the to the students, can the students get to the <coughs> officers again? You know, to, to increase the amount of interaction and the quality of the interaction between the police department and and our students in our elementary schools. Right. So I would say we, we brainstormed a lot of different ideas. This is the one that I think met the most of the concerns, and that's what we wanted to do. As I said, we're pretty open. If And we, as a police department, you know, outside of working with the schools, we have a lot of opportunities for kids to come to us. I understand the limitations in that, and that some kids may not come to us, so that's certainly something that... Um, we want to work on, and that's one of the reasons we have Officer Dobson working in this capacity. Um, so if there were new ideas brought up, I would say we'd be open to discussing them. But right now, there's no other programming that we're looking at as far as our involvement in the schools. Thank you. Yep. Chief, you have an event coming up for kids, don't you? 
Uh, yes, barring rain, but yes. <laughs> uh, this Saturday is actually police day at the Northampton Police Station. It's our third police day that we've had where we uh, invite a lot of other police agencies to come and come to our station. There's a lot of cruisers there. People have an opportunity to try on duty belts and uniforms and get a station tour and ask lots of questions. We'll have um, a lot of opportunities to do a number of different things there. So yes, Hold, we're hoping the rain holds off till about two or three. It goes from 10 to 2 on Saturday. And actually, we're doing something new this year where the, the cruisers are all going to begin up here at JFK on Saturday morning at 9.15. We're taking off and just doing a motorcade kind of down to the station just to draw attention to the event. And then all those cruisers will be up on our deck, and we usually um, park them all up there, and people can take a look at them all. So yes. Any other questions for the chief or for Officer Dobson? Yes. Oh, oh sorry, yes. My kids are watching this now. They'll, they'll want to know if the canines will be there tomorrow, on Saturday, rather. <laughs> I, I wish I had an answer, and All to right. be honest with you, I'm not planning the event, and I, I don't know the, the answer on the canines. <laughs> yes, I know the dogs, yes. <laughs> I appreciate that feedback. I'll certainly uh, check with our, our person you. who's in charge of it. Yep. How about the drone? <laughs> <laughs> the drone will be there. The drone will be there. Yes. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Chief. Thank you, Officer Dobson. We appreciate the report. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So the next item on the agenda, actually the next two items on the agenda include uh, uh, proclamations. Um, uh, one uh, involves, it actually um, happened a little bit earlier, but it was um, sort of between, since our last meeting, um, it's, in, it's actually a, a national day to recognize a uh, school lunch person, and it's called School Lunch Hero Day. Uh, and it's dated, uh, well, School Lunch Hero Day was uh, May 5th, 2017. Uh, whereas nutritious meals at schools are an essential part of the school day, and whereas the staff of the district's school meals and nutrition department are committed to providing healthful, nutritious meals to the district's children, and whereas the school nutrition pro professionals find creative ways to improve menus and get students excited about healthier choices, and whereas the men and women who prepare and serve school meals help nurture our children through their daily interactions and support, and whereas the day of Friday, May 5th, 2017 has been designated National School Lunch Hero Day, now therefore I, Mayor David Jane Arquist, do hereby proclaim that May 5th, 2017 was School Lunch Hero Day in the city of Northampton. The Northampton School District expresses its deep appreciation to those valuable employees and commends their good work on behalf of our children. And um, I believe uh, Mr. Trent is here, so if you want to come up and... Um, <coughs> We've even got the fancy <laughs> school lunch <laughs> hero. Uh, uh, Jared Zoska, let's go. So, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. I'd like to say a few words. You're, uh, <laughs> I am sometimes camera shy. Uh, <clears throat> I will say, I, I'm, even before I say anything, I wanna, I'm happy that. Officer Dobson's going to be in the school in the cafeterias. I'm definitely going to set him up a school lunch account. I'm always trying to drum up business. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to first say thank you very much for the recognition. It really means a lot to be noticed by everybody. The administration from staff, teachers, they all really welcome the school lunch program in their employees. I will honestly say, and I say this on purpose, that my coworkers within the school lunch program are incredible in their commitment to what they do and their dedication to provide school lunch for all the students and to really try to make all the students happy in the time frame in which they're within the cafeteria. So to be recognized with this type of a proclamation, thank you very much. It's very much appreciated. Thank you. Okay, uh, the next one uh, is um, another National uh, Recognition Day, and actually it's, it was actually yesterday, um, National School Nurse Day, uh, May 10th, uh, 2017. Um, whereas children are the future, and by investing th in them today, we are ensuring our world for tomorrow, and whereas all students have a right to, their, to have their health needs safely met while in the school setting, and whereas children today face more complex and life-threatening health problems requiring care in school, 
and where nur school nurses have served a critical role in improving public health and ensuring students' academic success for more than 100 years, and whereas school nurses are professional nurses that advance the well-being, academic success, and lifelong achievements of all students by serving on the front lines and providing a critical safety net for our nation's most fragile children, and whereas school nurses act as a liaison to the school community, parents, and health care providers on behalf of children's health by promoting wellness and improving health outcomes for our nation's children, and whereas school nurses support the health and educational success of children and youth by providing access to care when children's cognitive development is at its peak, and whereas school nurses are also members of school-based mental health teams, and whereas school nurses understand the link between health and learning and are in a position to make a positive difference for children every day. Now therefore I, Mayor David J. Narkowitz, uh, Mayor of the City of Northampton, do hereby proclaim May 10, 2017 <coughs> as National School Nurse Day. Let us acknowledge the accomplishments of school nurses and their efforts to meet the needs of today's students by improving the delivery of health care in our schools. Let us thank them for contributing to local communities by helping students stay healthy, in school, and ready to learn, and by helping to keep parents and guardians at work. In witness whereof, I have set my hand and imprinted the seal of the city of Northampton. So, uh, we have our director of school health. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> Karen Gardens here. And of course, I do have something to say. <laughs> <laughs> Should I set the timer? I'm you might. <laughs> So thank you for allowing me to address you this evening. I just wanted to share with you a few quick facts about your school nurses. All are registered nurses and also hold educator licenses from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. All are at minimum baccalaureate prepared, but most are either master's prepared in graduate school or hold a national certification, which is quite a rigorous process. Last year in our six schools, uh, we saw nearly 31,000 students in school health offices. 76% of our total student body visited the nurse at least once during the school year. Of the students seen, we returned 94% of them back to class ready to learn. In comparison, studies have found that in schools without school nursing services full time, the average return to class rate is just 75%. Additionally, research has shown that school nurses save principals almost an hour each day, teachers almost 20 minutes a day, and clerical staff more than 45 minutes a day. In fact, a 2014 study published by the CDC that looked at school health services in Massachusetts in particular found a cost benefit of $2.20 saved in medical costs and lost parent-teacher productivity for every $1 spent on school nursing services. Last year in Northampton, we gave 11,400 doses of medication and performed a myriad of other nursing procedures, including diabetic care, tube feedings, nebulizer treatments, and blood pressure monitoring. About 1,400 students were screened for vision and hearing problems. Another 760 were screened for scoliosis. As of last year, 37% of our total student body had a health issue that required some kind of monitoring or care by the school nurse. School nurses are essential in detecting and caring for childhood illnesses and disorders. So in conclusion, in the words of former U.S. Secretary of Health, Dr. Jocelyn Elders, you cannot educate an unhealthy child and you cannot keep an uneducated child healthy. I'd also like to recognize uh, with me tonight is one of our school nurses, uh, Karen Schiaffo from JFK Middle School, working very hard here at the middle school. And I thank you very much for this and the opportunity to speak to you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda is a presentation uh, by Mr. Michael O'Brien. And it is about a um, very generous gift that the organization League Legends uh, wishes to make to uh, the school department and Ryan Red Elementary School in particular. 
All right, so I heard presentation, so I went pretty formal with this. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I know a lot of you guys got uh, some of the materials ahead of time. I appreciate that getting sent out. But just uh, to go around, if anyone's curious, with these little packets. So feel free to take one, pass it around. It might be short, but uh, it's got all the information you, you might need and some uh, better colorful pictures there. So thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. My name is Mike O'Brien. I am uh, President and CEO of League Legends, which is an all-volunteer nonprofit here in Northampton. Uh, I won't go into the background of our charity because it'll take a long time, and I know you guys are busy, but if you have any interest in learning more about the charity itself, um, feel free to contact me. My business card's in there, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Here tonight to talk about a uh, memorial basketball um, this is a project that we've been talking about for uh, several years uh, within our organization. Um, we are trying to build this court. Uh, it's going to have uh, lights on it. That's what's a unique feature to it versus uh, the other basketball courts in town. So we feel it fills that void in the community, um, having an area for recreation that's public space with lights in it on it. Um, additionally, we think it's a great resource for the Ryan Road School community because uh, currently the basketball hoops they have there are the 10 foot regulation basketball hoops and a lot of little kids can't play on those they're just not you know low enough for them so we would be uh, building this court with the mindset of it being a resource to the elementary students as well so we would have adjustable basketball hoops as well you can kind of see an example of one of the models we're looking at down there in the bottom right corner uh, first and foremost this is meant to be a memorial uh, to our late friends David Holman and Miles Adams um, they passed away shortly after high school back in 2007 uh, they were alumni of Northampton High School, grew up in the community. Uh, we used to bond over playing basketball at Ryan Road uh, under the lights. But uh, that court there is basically a parking lot and uh, not really meant for uh, any real competitive play. So after this court is built, if it is built, we're going to uh, also hold youth basketball clinics there, maybe put on an adult basketball league that's kind of in the realm of what League Legends does and make it as affordable and available to the community members as possible. Um, going around, you guys can see some of the estimates that I have in there. We suspect it'll be about $70,000 with the lights included. Um, we uh, feel that we can get to that range um, definitely by next spring with the lights included, but we think we can even break ground on this project in August if necessary to have the asphalt, the hoops, the lines, and the partition fence that you can kind of see in the image here. Um, which is basically what they would need for the students to be able to use it at resource, uh, recess. So we'd like to move on this project really, really quickly, but obviously need your approval, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay, um, and that, of course, uh, relates to the, um, the two uh, votes that we have uh, scheduled um, to accept this as a gift, the gift of the actual material construction of these. Uh, so you're not, you're not giving us the funds, you're going to be actually... Yeah materials to construct yeah I'm learning the process a little bit but my understanding is that the materials gift is, is that we would uh, handle sort of the building of this project mm -hmm. and uh, okay. you know and you'd be working with our school uh, uh, facilities folks I'm looking at Tony <laughs> shaking his head yes yeah. mm -hmm. Tony Tony's been really helpful in this and so is principal Madden and uh, superintendent provost as well exactly so okay taking another wing okay um, so then what the school committee is essentially being asked to do is to take a vote to um, accept this uh, generous offer from uh, Michael and his colleagues at League Legends um, to go ahead and, and uh, construct this memorial court. Any questions or? Yes. Practical question. I think yeah, it's an easy answer, but clearly this is close ish to the baseball courts. People have looked at all of this and it's. Yeah, I'm happy to address great. that very much. So, um, so I think when you guys first got the email out from Laura, it, uh, it had sort of a, a different. Yeah. basically outlines to where this would be so we took that in consideration currently there's the uh, the map the asphalt with the map illustration on it at Ryan Road School um, principal man has already said that it was okay for us to kind of go over that portion originally my design was to avoid that she said it was okay to go over that considering we're basically building a recreational space anyway so now it's uh, definitely out of uh, contention with the baseball fields it's also out of contention with the swing sets there as well so it's definitely in a spot that it fits pretty well and if necessary if someone did feel that it was too close to the foul ball territory of field two, which is this baseball field here, um, there's plenty of real estate to go in this direction. So that has been accounted for. Thank you. Sure. 
<clears throat> Michael, I just want to say that, um, or for anybody on the committee, I've, I've been to your tournament Thanks. maybe every year or close to every year, and it's one of my all-time favorite things in Thank Northampton. You. My son comes back from Boston, and he tells me it's his favorite thing, <laughs> and I go. And so Dylan sees all of his friends. I see my old friends, and, and I, I go out of my way to thank you every year, but probably many people do. But the, the passion that you have, Thank the, you. the uh, professionalism, the growth you have you have family part you know games you have tons of volunteers it's so much fun it's such a great balance between like the spirit of um the, your your colleagues who passed away and the community building and then there's this element of competition because it's sport and yeah. we have produced some really fine basketball <laughs> players who seem to come back from all over the world to to participate so yeah. this is um i've been on the committee for a month so i haven't had that many chances but i can say without a doubt this will be the yes, I am most honored to support. Well, I am you. really enthusiastic, and I wish you the best of luck. Um, and I'm really thrilled also to see that in the future you're planning to consider a, ho a hockey rink. Yeah, I appreciate you actually bringing that up. So yeah. this currently is, uh, you know, asphalt with basketball hoops, but we think there's a lot of potential here as well because I know that they're going to bring it up in a second. I want to ruin it, but they're having an outdoor community classroom there. So maybe the lights there could be a power source for that outdoor classroom as well. Um, practical applications include other events that could be held there after school hours. You know, now that you have lights outdoors, now you have dedicated space for that. Um, the hockey rink is a really unique feature. That doesn't exist at all in Northampton right now. And that would be something that we would talk about in the future. But currently we have a three-phase plan for the project to put the basketball courts in, put the lights in, and then phase three is pretty much in perpetuity. We want to make continued improvements to it. So an outdoor rink, perhaps having a, an electronic scoreboard there, maybe even like a, a shed there for uh, students to store equipment. Um, it could also double as a little concessions booth, maybe for the farm leagues and football practices there. I think we can really build and maximize the potential of that space and sort of the catalyst for it. Schools are um, such a great community. I'm so glad you're having it at the school, and I'm particularly happy you're having it in Ward 6. Yeah. Um, but they're such a hub for community, and yeah. so anywhere else it wouldn't, you know, probably wouldn't be used as often, and just your vision for how this could become something that's used not only by, you know, once a year event, but so far beyond that is really admirable. So yeah. thank you so much. Thank you very much. I actually, I'd love to speak to that point too. Um, Tony and I, and also Anne-Marie Mogio from the Rec Department, we've actually spent you know, many, many back and forth talking about locations in Northampton where a basketball court with lights would fit. And we really are kind of on this location and nowhere else where it would have, you know, a, a negative impact in the community. Not necessarily a negative impact, but a lot of people are concerned about the lights or about the positioning of it and everything like that. It would be, I think, very welcomed in the Ryan Road community. We're already kind of established in that neighborhood of town. Um, I think also, you know, there's already the baseball leagues and the football leagues that go up until about dusk as well. So we're kind of in that, you know, same time frame. We're not really interrupting anyone's schedule in that area. And I think it'll be a really welcomed resource that I think hopefully, you know, motivates other people in that area to do similar things when they grow up and, you know, have a positive influence on the community. Any other questions? Okay, with the vice chair. Great. I would love to make a motion to... Uh, Accept the basketball court gift uh, in memorial at Ryan Road Elementary School from League Legends. Second. Seconded by the Ward Six com committee member. Um, any um, any other discussion or questions? Hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Any abstentions? So unanimously and gratefully accepted. Thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next item is a, uh, a gift as well. Uh, this is, um, this is uh, related to the outdoor classroom. Uh, this is a, a gift a donation by Valley Home Improvement, uh, $12,000 worth of labor uh, to build an outdoor classroom. And Principal Madden is already at the podium. So. Here I am. Okay. Uh, yeah, we're going to spend all our time outdoors, either okay. gardening yes. or, <laughs> or playing basketball. So that's fabulous. Uh, yeah, this seems to be our lucky spring uh, because we're getting these wonderful outdoor additions. So, yes, uh, Valley Home Improvement has agreed to do all the labor uh, for this project for free. It's been a dream of mine since I've arrived at Ryan Road because we are very committed to outdoor education, and I think it's going to enhance our ability to to do all sorts of projects outside. I also neglected yes, sorry. to mention that there's also a $6,000 yes. PTO gift. So the PTO is paying the for, materials. Uh, for the materials and Valley Home Improvement is paying for the labor. And we're very excited. The, the hope is that it's going to be finished on the first day of school. 
Um, so that'll be very exciting. And, um, you know, we have cooperation uh, with the Hitchcock Center, with School Sprouts, with Grow Food Northampton, and so with all of those different partnerships, we're all excited to be able to access education out, outside. It's going to have a roof. I don't know if you've spent much time there in the hot sun, but um, it's, it's awful, and there was no place for shade, and so it will be really nice to be, have a shaded outdoor space, and you know, I hope we can use it even in the winter because it has a, a good roof, and Valley Home Improvement is, uh, I think, an excellent contractor, so I think we really hit the jackpot here this spring. Any questions? Yes. Could you just describe it in a little bit? Yeah, I should have brought a, 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 a <laughs> diagram. Did you bring one for her? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I have what we what we have is sort of a, a general model. Uh, I mean, you, you know, what I'm hoping is a, sort of a gazebo-like model, and it has seats around. So, and then uh, what we've added when we talked to the contractor, I wanted a table in the middle, not to sit at. Um, but so that people could bring materials, teachers could bring materials or um, experiment, science experiments there, and so there'll be a table in the center as well, and it'll be, a, they'll, it'll be um, have a ramp to the blacktop so that we can have it accessible for all. Um, so yes, I think it's going to be really great. Does that uh, yeah. give you? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Other questions? Okay. All right, then I'll make a motion to accept the two gifts. Ryan Road Outdoor Classroom, first Ryan Road PTO in the amount of $6,000 to purchase materials for the classroom, and from ha uh, Valley Home Improvements in the amount of 12000 for the labor to build the classroom. Is there a second? Okay, seconded by uh, Bonnie Kaufman. Um, any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Next next year, you all should come down to Ryan Road. You can have meetings right in our outdoor classroom. Yeah, we have a little five on five. <laughs> very competitive. However. Okay, thank you. She's got her basketball sneakers on right now. <laughs> Ready to go. Okay, so next we have another series of gifts. Um, we have a gift uh, from Big Y Northampton. Uh, $3,000 uh, to district schools. Yes, Big Y had its grand reopening after some renovations last week. They invited all the principals and the superintendent to attend. And besides handing them cake, they also handed each of the principals a check for $500 to use for materials for their building. So it's a grand total of $3,000 that we thank the Big Y for. Great. No, I got a hat. Cool. I'll make a motion to accept <laughs> the Big Y gift in the amount of $3,000 to the district schools. Is there a second? Second. Okay. There's been a motion made and seconded to accept the gift. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Next, we have a gift from Malvern Incorporated, uh, $3,000 to the NHS robotics team. Yes, Malvern Instruments has supported our robotics programs for a number of years, I've, at least for the three years I've been here, and I think it goes back beyond that. They're able to use this each year to underwrite some of the costs of operating the robotics team between the materials to build the projects and the trips that they take. Okay. All right, make a motion to accept the Malvern uh, gift in the amount of $3,000 for NHS robotics team. <coughs> Thank you. There's a second from Ms. Fallon. Any discussion on this one? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstention? Okay, that one passes. The next item on the agenda is a gift from the Bridge Street PTO, $2,989.49 for library books. Yes, if you checked in on Valley Gibbs last week, we actually had a lot of school organizations that were part of that and that received donations. A lot, I think all of our PTOs were part of it. The Bridge Street PTO immediately turned around, I think the next day, and wrote the check out for the amount that had been re raised on behalf of the PTO to turn around and donate it directly to Bridge Street so they could buy books for the library. I'd right, make a motion to accept the gift to Bridge Street PTO in the amount of $2,989.49 for library books. Second. Okay, there's a second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? And finally, a gift of Ryan Road PTO for a new stage curtain in the gymnasium. Yes, the PTO received a private donation from a parent that wishes to remain anonymous, and they are donating to us for the purchase of the stage curtain. Okay. 
Right, so I'll make a motion to accept the gift Ryan Road PTO for a new stage curtain for the gymnasium. Okay. Is there a second? Okay. Second. Uh, any discussion? Yes. How much does it cost? It just covers the full cost. Yes. The gift will cover the entire cost. So around two thousand dollars. Two thousand. Around. Yeah. Got it. Thanks. It's nice. actually three families. So they'll purchase and then we'll install it or have it installed or okay 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 uh, you've made the motion it's been seconded all those in favor please say aye. aye aye opposed any abstentions okay so that concludes the gifts uh, just a quick note that that was nearly one hundred thousand dollars worth of generous gifts from the community <coughs> and um, I speak on behalf of the entire committee when I say thank you very much to all those we're able to make these generous donations to us. Thank you. Next, we have two job descriptions that require a vote of the school committee. The first is a job description for a department grade level chair, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Provost. Thank you. This job description comes to you as part of our work to implement the newly ratified CBAs. As you will recall, one of the uh, provisions created within those uh, agreements was the creation of elementary uh, department chairs and so as we began the process the first step was to review the existing job descriptions for department chairs at middle and high school and that's when we discovered that there was no existing job description so then the task became to create a job description that will be flexible enough to cover the pre-k through or k through 12 department chairs um, so this is a job description that really has three sources um, feeding into it one is the language within the contract that talks about um, the, the chair positions. And then the two other sources are two prior um, created job descriptions, one for the CTLs, curriculum teacher leaders, and one for the grade level leaders because um, we will anticipate many of those functions being taken over by the grade level uh, elementary department chairs. So um, I have sent both of these job descriptions to the association prior to bringing them to the school committee. Um, someone asked earlier in the day if there was any concern and I reported that there wasn't. There was one call that I received very late in the day um, indicating that on the fourth bullet point there was a concern around the word implementation um, and the, the chapter coordinator who I spoke to said that and I also uh, agree that if there was an amendment to change that word from implementation to dissemination it would be mutually acceptable okay so um, that's the report would someone like to make a motion on that put that description forward uh, for approval with the with the amendment to it as part of the motion I make a motion to um, the job description, job description for the department grade level chair uh, with the amendment. Okay. So there's it's seconded by Mr. Meyer. Any questions about that, Mr. Can, can you just um, tell me again, like everybody, like the, the main folks that have uh, read this and endorsed it, if you will. So this was developed through the central office. It went to HR um, to make sure that it has all the required boilerplate language. And then it went to the association. So, um, and are you confident that the association represents the, the, the school building principals as an example? Have they looked at this? Have other teachers looked at this to? Uh, I, I, I believe that Nancy shared it with some of the uh, principals as, as she was developing the position. I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, I do think that um, the chapter coordinator does speak on behalf of the teachers with respect to this. Just for a little bit more description on what the objection was in the fourth bullet point. Yeah. Concern was that implementation was too closely aligned with the um, functions of Unit B or the principals. Um, and so they felt that dissemination made that a less administrative function. Yeah, I think I think what um, what I was curious about this this being a new position, and you know we talked about this a little bit earlier, but I, I just I just want to make sure that this 
creates an opportunity to enhance uh, the teaching and learning and the, the culture of the schools, the communication across the district, <coughs> et cetera. So I understand that maybe it, it just seems so broad and it, it's hard to define exactly what the person's going to do. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wonder whether um, enough people have looked at it and whether there's a general acceptance that maybe this is st step one and that as the position becomes defined and the strengths and weaknesses or the time commitment that maybe it would be um, if necessary, more clearly defined or delineated as to what the exact responsibilities are? Do you foresee that occurring, or is that something that? We frequently change job descriptions. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know what the future holds with this one. I yeah. wouldn't suspect that it's likely to require a revision very soon, because as you said, it's written to yeah. be broad. It's written to um, really try to carry the more traditional functions of the department chairs that we have at the secondary level, and also to sort of incorporate some of the things we've been trying to do with the grade level leaders and CTLs at right. the elementary level. Um, so within that, you have sort of the traditional role of the chair, and then you have the new teacher leadership roles that we've been trying to create through those other positions. Yeah. So I think that it's fairly broad. Mm -hmm. Typically the reason that we would be bringing forward a job description is because we figured or we thought that it was too restrictive for what we were trying to do. Um, in fact, the next job descriptions we're bringing, we're bringing <laughs> um, because we, we felt that as they were currently written, they were too restrictive. So yeah. in, in my view, uh, having job descriptions that provide more latitude, yeah. provide more um, insurance against revision, but it's not perfect and there's no, um, to, in my mind, no uh, downside to revising job descriptions to make them better as we go along. And um, also, do you know what the process would be um, for the elementary school teachers to apply for this and, and ha when that will happen? Is this set up for next year? The position will be posted. One of the reasons why we wanted to bring this forward is because when we post a position, we always put the job description with it so people can know what the expectations are. Yeah. Um, so with an approved job description, then we would um, move forward to post. At this point in the year, I don't think it makes sense to appoint um, department chairs for the remaining 25 days of school or however long there is. Sure. So I would expect that the hiring would take place either late spring or over the summer so that we could start rolling with these new positions next fall. Yeah. Thank you. I just had a question that me came late, which was, will they be teaching? Are they going to be teaching? Yes, the, these are full-time teaching <coughs> positions. So is there, did you not include that intentionally? It's an, additional, it's an additional role. So okay. For example. Okay. Yep. Okay. I got it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Okay. So there's been a motion made and seconded to approve these new department head job titles. Uh, any further discussion? Actually, I'm sorry. Yes. I'm so sorry. I just have one thing to say um, in response to Lonnie. I just, I, I think that um, the grade level chairs in the elementary department came out of discussion and I think that one of the things of having something that's not prescriptive is that the teachers know what they're doing and know how to guide each other and that they are um, that they are you know uh, that they have a leadership role to play um, also that can be guided by their best practice um, so I just s sort of on that side of things, I think that that was part of what came out of a lot of conversations. Yeah, I appreciate that greatly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think for me, it's um, it's hard for me to visualize what exactly the person would be doing, and but I, I I also understand and embrace the fact that they will be doing it for the first time. They'll learn what's most valuable, and I love right, the and that they're a professional. Their peers in order to do something that's valuable, yeah. but I just didn't know whether. It seems like such an extraordinary, extreme difference between elementary school and, and high school. It's easier to visualize what a content area person would do. They've, been done, it, they've done it historically, and it's, it's something that's commonly done. So I think I was just looking for something that would help spell out to me more clearly what an elementary school person would do. But I also totally appreciate what you're saying is yeah. that why manage that? If it could be built up from within, that would be the best of all worlds. Yeah, and that they're professionals. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think that completes our discussion. So all those in favor of approving the job description, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so the next item is another job description. This is the Associate Director of Student Services 
position, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Provost. Thank you. This proposal is to um, basically signal a change of administrative strategy and how we look at the two Unit B positions within the special ed administration structure. Currently, there is one position, early childhood director, that's responsible for pre-K through two, and another position that's responsible for all the rest of the grades. Um, the person who's currently in the early childhood position is retiring. The person who is currently within the other position is moving up to the role of special ed director. So both of the positions need to be filled. And at this point, we don't know what skills the people will bring to the position. So our goal here is to write a job description that basically covers all of the special ed supervisory responsibilities and says, you know, if you're applying for this, you could end up in any role in special ed supervision. And then when we see who we end up hiring, divide up the tasks in the way that plays to their strengths and minimizes their weaknesses. Okay. <clears throat> any uh, any questions or discussions? Mr. Meyer. So when I first saw this, I, my first thought was, wait, they're not cutting back to one. So, right. <laughs> <laughs> so the intention is that there'll be two then. Yes. Okay, thank you. Ms. Busatsky. I guess I was just wondering how I appreciate that it gives greater flexibility, but could there be a downside where both of them sort of have more kind of more strengths in the early childhood area, you know, that we could actually end up with sort of duplicative strengths rather than having it kind of all fall out nicely? <coughs> that would be my one concern. That's something that we can control. You know, if we make that, if we create that problem, it's because we chose poorly. Got it. Um, we won't be filling the two positions simultaneously, right? One will have to be hired before the other. And once one person is hired, I think that will kind of guide what we're looking for in the second one. We'll be looking for the complement, not the duplication. Got it. Great. Thank you. Okay. So I'll make a motion on the job descri description for the Associate Director of Student Services. Second. Okay. So there's been a motion made and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so now we move to a report <coughs> of the Rules and Policy Subcommittee. We have a couple of second readings and votes, and then a first reading. And I'll turn it over to uh, Ms. Fallon. Thanks. Um, so, policies IJNDC, which is school <coughs> district web pages, and social media policy IJNDD, social media and electronic communications. Um, our both second readings, and we will be voting on them tonight. Um, policy IJNDC is a new policy, and there's a slight revision on the other. Um, but they were both intended to address concerns that staff had with our current policy IJNDD, which requires all staff websites to be Google sites within the campaign through 12 um, The two policies attempt to strike a balance between um, student protection and student access by creating a protocol for vetting and identifying beyond the Northampton K-12 domain, which teachers may also use. Um, so this first policy we're voting on, IJNDC, uh, directs the Digital Literacy Computer Science Coordinator, Molly McLaughlin, to monitor a list of vendors and applications that are acceptable for teachers to use. And that will be kept up to date, obviously, as new applications and websites become available. Um, so that's, yeah, so that's the first policy that would be up for a vote. Okay. It's brand new. Would you like to make a motion? So I move to approve uh, policy IJNDC. Second. Okay. Motion. Okay. This has been a motion made and seconded. Any, um, any questions or discussion about the new policy? Okay. Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So we'll move on to social media. <laughs> Yeah, as I mentioned, that's a small revision. Um, it is only changing um, under heading two, letter C, that all staff websites must comply with school committee policy IJNDC, which you just approved and is newly created. Um, and that's the only change to that policy. So I would move to approve policy IJNDD. Okay. Is there a motion on that? It's moved and seconded. And seconded. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's an auction block up or something. Yeah. <laughs> Got to get some quicker here. All those in favor of approving the uh, social media and electronic policy revision, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? 
Okay. So next is a first reading on field trips revised. Okay. Um, so you've all read the the minutes of the meeting. It, I just want to be clear that despite the only, I think we changed four or five words, there were hours of conversations involved in this. Um, but primarily our concern was to um, address uh, the issue that Mr. Reed m raised over whether or not we are in fact following our field trip policy. Um, so I consulted with our unofficial school committee historian, Lisa Minnick, who thankfully has a really good memory. Um, and it turns out that uh, it was as Ms. Walzak had mentioned in, that, in our last meeting that um, letter D was causing the confusion um, where it said teachers and other school staff are prohibited from soliciting privately run trips through the school system. Um, and that there, that was not clear to people that that was being interpreted different ways by different people. And so, the original intention of the policy was to was to incur, was to allow for teachers only to use um, licensed travel agencies, third parties, as opposed to private individuals. So I think that the the issue of the word private came in, like private versus corporation to, or a company, um, and it was to. Um, to protect the the school district um, or limit its legal um, what's the word liability word? liability yeah um, and so we suggested changing that to teachers and other school staff are prohibited from soliciting non school sponsored trips through the school system um, part of that is because one of the other policies that was referred to us for discussion was policy KHAB which was the distribution of non school literature. It was never intended to have anything to do with trips um, because once these trips are approved, they are school sanctioned, and so it's not non school based literature, it's school based literature or school. So the hope was that it would make it clear that they are prohibited from soliciting non school sponsored trips through the school system, um, and it is our hope that these trips will be through a licensed professional travel agency. Um, the other change that was suggest most suggested was the only area in which we were not to the letter complying with our policy was that if students are charged individual fees for participation, the district will make every effort to provide scholarships where needed. Unfortunately, due to all the budget cuts, it wasn't the district that was really providing the financial aid for all of these school trips, whether it's from nature's classroom to trips to the, um, to the UMass to um, any of the other trips, it was through PTO fundraising, outside groups, group fundraising, parental contributions. Um, and so we have um, suggested that that be amended to if students are charged individual fees for participation, every effort will be made to provide financial assistance. Um, and that leaves it open for when the district suddenly is fully funded and we are able to, we would still be able to, but in the meantime, that, that financial assistance is being provided by a variety of other groups. Um, and so those were the only two changes that were recommended at this time. Okay. So you're making a motion to, move to approve uh, policy IJOA. It's just first reading. First oh, sorry. Yeah, no, I'm not. Oh, I'm sorry. Motion. My, my, my mistake. I was just. Yeah, your don't read me. Uh, <laughs> see if you're reading the agenda. Uh, okay, so that's a first reading, to, but it is a time if people have questions. Right. Yeah. Mr. Moore. So with all this focus on like the big trips, the ones where we, where you know, the, where we pretty much are pretty sure that um, it would make sense to have essentially a, some agency that's in the business of running those kind of trips be a contractor for us. What about the trips that are big trips that aren't that big of trips where in fact our faculty might have enough expertise and knowledge about the thing that they're going to go do that um, they wouldn't need to have something like that. Does this policy I, yeah, is I it silent as saying. to those? I'm just thinking about back when I was in high school and the biology club went on a field trip to Florida, which is a big deal because you're in Kansas. Went on, a, <laughs> went on a field trip to Florida to, to 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 go to the Gulf of Mexico and and do, you know, biology stuff around the ocean, and they were hosted by alumni of the high school who were professors at universities in Florida, but none of them were professional tour, you know, high school tour leaders, but they were outstanding field trips 
And so I'm wondering, does, I, does this policy, no, what would happen doesn't. if what it, would happen it, if something it, like that happened and here? And so it doesn't, because <laughs> what it says is that they're prohibited from soliciting non-school sponsored trips. And so by getting the school committee's approval, it becomes a school sponsored trip. So for so. example, if that particular high school teacher from back in my youth were to appear here with a proposal, he was proposal and would lay out who was going to be providing instruction, what the accommodations were going to be, and all of that, even though it was, we could approve it. Uh, and then, and then yeah. once that happened, this policy would allow it. Sure, Dr. Provost. Um, for clarification, I think it, it might help to think about the other side, what's intended to be prohibited instead yeah, exactly. of... Exactly. <laughs> um, so my recollection of Laura's report of of uh, Lisa Minnick's recollection was the problem was <laughs> that there were groups like you see in the newspaper, you know, that are organizing trips to Fenway Park or wherever that were, you know, somehow public resources were being used in order to help gin up business for that. And that's what they were trying to put the kibosh on. Mm -hmm. So I think in the case you give, it's not an outside group, it's a teacher who's trying to organize an event and that's, that's Pro, that's uh, allowed. Not prohibited. <laughs> right, exactly. Okay. Any other questions on first reading? So that'll come back to you uh, to us at our next meeting for second reading. And then I'll make a motion. And then you can make that motion. Okay. I'll second quickly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So any other um, any other report from rules and policy? Um, no, we discussed policy uh, PHAB. Uh, there was no recommend recommendation made to the committee. Um, and policy BIB, also no recommendation okay. for changes. Okay, so um, we next we do have a um, matter that we would like uh, is being requested to be referred to Rules and Policy Committee. That's the next item on the regular agenda. And I believe um, Ms. Burnham would like yeah. to uh, make a motion on this. Yes, um, to make a motion to refer deliberation on Massachusetts General Law Part 1 Title 7, Chapter 71. Um, I can read it out loud. Should I read the section because people don't have it, or should I just describe it to people? You can just give a description. Okay. Just, so just this was brought um, up. Our student representative, Elena, um, had contacted me. Actually, Laura Fallon had brought this up um, a bunch of months ago. A couple years ago. A couple <laughs> years. I don't know. Like in last, maybe when we were, when I was elected, and there was a lot of changeover. So I think that um, it had gotten lost in the hubbub, but basically, do, I mean, Elena, do you want to, I don't want to, I don't need to be in charge. I can refer to it when I need to, but why don't you talk about it? Yeah, so um, there's a state policy, this policy that you're referring to, um, that I think it mandates, um, mandates that you, the school committee, um, be meeting with a student advisory committee at least once every two months. Other months. Month, every, every two every months. Other. Um, so you guys already have me here as your school committee student representative. But there is this resource in our law that um, lets you guys meet with a larger body of students. Um, so as you may remember back from the student union came to talk to you last spring, um, I'm elected through a student union at NHS, which those members are elected from the student body. Um, so there is that group of students that exists that is your student advisory council. Um, and we would love to be able to meet with you. Um, and it's just a great way for you guys to hear from more students than just me. Um, it's a great way for you guys to get more perspectives. And it's an awesome way for more students to be involved in the school committee. So I make a motion to refer deliberation on a procedure for student advisory committee participation to the rules and policy subcommittee. So there's been a motion made and seconded to refer this issue to rules and policy. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Next, uh, we have a, uh, we received a letter uh, from the association requesting uh, full-time release from teaching for the association <coughs> president. Um, and we would, uh, the superintendent is on the, listed on the agenda here. Um, to re have this referred to our negotiating subcommittee. Yes. The members of the school committee received an email dated May 1st, 2017 at 1044 a.m. from Julie Spencer Robinson ed, um, advising them of the outcome of the association election and the request to raise dues and asking <laughs> to enter into negotiations for another year of release time. 
in the past the way this has been dealt with is um, referring it to the the uh, negotiating subcommittee and then if um, a time crunch uh, were to ensue uh, negotiating with the whole committee um, but in the past the, the procedure has been to start with the negotiating subcommittee and see if they can reach an agreement is this the second or the third year I can't remember this would full time be release this would be this year would be three. three so this would be year three mm -hmm. So could I get a motion to refer that? Sure, I'll make a motion to refer the NACE request for full-time release for from teaching for association president to the negotiating subcommittee. Second. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that matter is referred to the negotiating subcommittee. Uh, next, we have a required vote uh, for an extension to the business administrator's contract, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Provost. I'm pleased to report that I've, um, on your behalf, discussed terms with the business manager and would be um, seeking your approval of a 16-month contract. It's a flat rate of uh, 114627 per year, um, broken down into biweekly payments for the entire term. Okay. I'll make a motion. Um to uh, approve the business administrator contract extension for 16 months. Second. Okay, so there's been a motion made and seconded uh, this to extend Ms. Walzak's contract for 16 months. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, uh, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Sir, can, can okay. I just report one thing? Sure can. I, I would like to say that I did get a, a um, expression of relief from one of the school committee members when they read this um, there was a miscommunication that about her leaving in the fall might have meant this upcoming fall and the idea that we're able to keep her through a whole year and then the following fall um, lose her was reassuring for this member as it is for me Excellent. <laughs> okay so next we have the uh, report from uh, said business administrator on the uh, <laughs> FY16 end of year audit report as well as your business report and personnel report. First I should say thank you for that vote and I look <laughs> forward to the end of my career finishing out in Northampton. Um, okay as um, most school committee members are aware every year we have a comprehensive end of year financial report to the Department of Ed. Usually you receive the summary pages when I've completed that report in the fall so you have a little bit of background on it. We are required to have an audit of that particular report done. On a regular basis, we are audited as part of the city audit, but this is actually an audit of the report to make sure that we're reporting our expenditures in the appropriate categories to the Department of Ed for all the analysis that they do. So each year when the audit report comes in, you receive a copy of it. I've outlined in the cover letter, um, maybe my last year I will get zero findings. I. 35 years I haven't got there yet but um, <laughs> they seem to have to find <laughs> something, grand every, finale. something every year to catch you on so there were six findings in this report some of them are crossover they have to do with if a, a, like there was a grant from the prior year that was missed and it affected the revenues and the expenditures it was a tiny grant that had closed out a year before the audit so we had actually filed everything away and missed it when we did it um, so some of the findings do affect different things but I've outlined in the cover letter for you a summary of what the findings were all of the things have been amended as I said in the cover letter one of the amendments that was filed regarding the um, community preservation grant that the city had for Jackson playground renovations the Department of Ed has actually said we probably should not have amended the report to include those expenditures and I'm waiting to hear from them whether I have to unamend the report there's a difference of opinion because the community preser preservation grant was not a grant to the school department so they're determining whether or not that has to be reported as a school expenditure. The auditor had felt it did. I followed the audit directions and amended the report. Now I'm waiting to hear if I have to unmend the report for that. So there's still some disagreement with the state on that level. This is informational. I don't believe it needs a vote. Okay. Any questions about the um, former CPC member? Do you have any thoughts, uh, uh, Mr. Meyer? I, I'm <coughs> I'm going to wait with eager anticipation to yes. see what the ruling is. <laughs> exactly. So they're always very interesting. Yes. C.O.R. and can argue with itself, actually. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Uh, next is the business administrator report. 
Yeah. So the first thing is your update on the um, fiscal budget. You have the printout there, but in summary, as we head into the end of the year, things are actually looking a little bit better. Um, we have a smaller def. It appears we will have a smaller deficit in utilities than I had projected. We'll have a balance in subs, and probably the best news of all is we received word yesterday that we received an extraordinary relief grant under the circuit breaker program from the Department of Ed. Now, that was in the amount of one hundred and fifty-six thousand dollars and change. Um, due in large part, oh, she's still here, to the efforts of our Director of Student Services to file that. It's a very detailed, um, I'm not sure I really would call it a grant application, but it's like a detailed grant application. Good news to get the grant. The bad news is you only get the grant if your special ed eligible expenses have increased by more than 125% from the prior year. This actually relates to what we've been discussing on the budget all year. We have we froze accounts in the spring from the schools. We did a no number of other measures because we expected to have more special ed expended expenses as we got into the fall. We are having those expenses to the degree that we were able to qualify for the additional state aid. What that is letting us do, however, is we have unfrozen the money that we took from the schools and we're allowing them to do some more expenditures before the close of the fiscal year. And we've also been able to redirect some of the money um, that we project as savings in the substitute count accounts to provide some professional development for all of our elementary teachers <coughs> around the new inclusion model coming up next year. So that was something that we thought was important to do for them. So overall, the budget is looking better than it had looked, and the extraordinary relief was kind of the, the final stone to make things look good. Any questions about the uh, business administrator's report? Oh, no, there's a few more pieces. Oh, there's more. <laughs> <laughs> the next piece is not as good. Um, school lunch debt, just to give you an update. Um, this is the third year we're actually dealing with this under the changes and regulations for the new members. We are now required to appropriate from the school budget at the end of the year monies to cover any unpaid parent debt in the lunch program so that it doesn't carry forward in the program. We do continue to track that. Some parents will make payments the following fiscal year. Um, at this point, we have in excess of $12,000 in debt on our books. Several thousand of that is from representing students who have left the district. So we probably will never be able to recoup those funds from them. But we've got a portion of outstanding debt from last year as well as increasing debt from this year. Um, at 4.30 this afternoon, I opened my, my email, and I'm not sure why I had three emails, but um, Department of Ed actually sent out today a 72-page document from the U.S. Department of Agriculture entitled Overcoming the Unpaid Meal Challenge. I have not read this whole thing based on the timing of it, but I think that it's very relevant. It shows you that this is a national issue going on. Um, two of the things I noticed in here, it said that, you know, the USDA is sensitive to the fact that local officials must balance their desire to provide for hungry children lacking the means to pay for their food with the demands of maintaining the financial viability of their overall food service budget. And I think that really reflects what we're dealing with. And they go through and they talk about um, increase a robust notification system to prevent meal charges by notifying parents of low account balances. They talk about different ways we can do it. Again, I haven't read the whole thing, but the summary of proposals are basically things that we have been doing for a couple of years. So maybe we'll get some new ideas out of it, but it's a, apparently a growing issue that the USDA was able to put something out across the country on it. When you say it's students that left the system, do you mean that they've graduated or do you mean that they were only here for a short period of time and it may not be and a short period of time. At this point, we're not dealing with graduates because this is new. Right. And typically, your high schools aren't where you incur as much unpaid debt because what high school students tend to like is the a la carte offerings, and you right. can't purchase a la carte unless you have funds. So it's more the younger students, and if a family moves out of town. So I guess that's my question. Does that, does, if you, if, if you were to qualify, if, if it's a family that's trans, you know, that they're moving from one district to another for whatever reason, would their classification follow them, right? Is, that, is it only Massachusetts based? Is it by school district? Our is it national? Like how, do, if you qualify in one place, do, are they not here long enough to qualify here? Or? There's two ways that students can qualify for free lunch or reduced lunch. One is, quote, the old fashioned application method that anybody can apply for. The forms are online on our website. The more common now, is we have to do a verification at least three times a year, and I believe Mr. Trinfaglia does it once a month, where we run our student database through the state's database, and it pulls out any student who's eligible for WIC, 
I, I'm not sure what all the different state aids are, but mm -hmm. any student whose family is receiving financial assistance through some state mechanism is automatically pre-qualified for free lunch. So if they're, if they're moving out of state or moving, I'm just trying to say, think like if there's no, if it's, if it's a state by state basis and you've got families that are moving in and out of different states, they wouldn't necessarily qualify. They wouldn't qualify right away. They could fill out an application with us at any point during the school year, just as if someone's financial situation changes, they can apply at any time. But if they move in state and they go and apply for any of the state assistance, right. They would be caught the next time we run their names through the is state database. Is there a residency database. requirement to be eligible for state services? I don't know. Generally, residency meaning you have to be here. Like, there's not a there's not a time. Like, you have to be here for a certain period. Like, immediately mm -hmm. upon having a mailing address here, you pretty much. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was just trying to figure out. That seems like a high number for students that left the system. That's money. That's just money, though, not it's not, not kids. I didn't provide. No, no, no. I mean, like, it's a that's a significant amount of money. Yes. 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 Um, but also, we don't know what financial situation. I mean, you were asking about free and people yeah. on free and reduced lunch, but the twelve thousand dollars could be. It is students who have to pay. It's students who have to Full pay. Price. Right. No, but that's why I'm saying if 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 there's. Because from what I've heard, there are some families that they, they if you, you move here and then you lose a job, then you move to another state. Like, and I'm saying if, if, you were, if that were to happen in reverse and they're moving here because they were in Hartford and then they got it, you know, do, is there some sort of mechanism where they're not getting tagged as being eligible for free and reduced lunch? Or where, I was, I was hoping there was a national system in place to identify Okay. More transient but, families, right? I understand. So a portion of this might be transient families, but a portion of this could be just anybody who's leaving, right? I mean, we no. don't have any data to point us in any direction well, to the population. I mean, it's any student who's withdrawn from the system that had a right. balance owed to the uh, food service right. department, so, right? And how many families does this even represent? We just don't even. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, mean you, you should know that. That's why I'm, I'm sure saying. you know. We don't know, I'm but sure someone knows. adds. I'm yeah. saying we don't. Yeah. As right. a committee right now. Well, it'd just be interesting to understand. The nature of schools is we have students withdrawing and enrolling at all times during the school year. So right. it's, it's you, you do. I'm sorry. Go ahead. You do know. I mean, you do have 26 students owe seven thousand two hundred dollars. I mean, yes. you have it. Oh, right there. Sorry. That yeah. data. I mean, that's it's not a lot for that big. Right. A lot of a small number of kids are representing about seventy five percent of the debt. Um, and yes, we have those names. One is up to a thousand dollars. Under your policy, we don't refuse we don't refuse anybody the, what's called the Type A lunch, the main lunch. They're not able to buy extra milk. They're not able to buy ice cream and any other a la carte offerings. But under your policy, we provide the Type A lunch to any student that wants it. So, you know, we're faced with some heavy expenses that the district is having to bear for the people that aren't able to or willing to, and you know, it can vary by circumstance. Pay their bills. Ms. Hennessy, and then Dr. Provost, I'm wondering you had um, mentioned a program that had an, an acronym FFA or something. Can you talk I, about that, or have I you actually, been talking to anyone? I actually thought you sent me that information to begin with. I um, sent you an article. I think. Yes, so it, it's called Feed the Future Forward, mm -hmm. um, and that email was about a, a week or so ago. I have had a conversation <laughs> with John Tranfaglia. Um, basically, what Feed the Future Forward is is an organization that's basically forming to do fundraisers for food um, service departments to help discharge some of the bad debt. Not that, it, um, not that it eliminates the debt for individuals, but reduces the amount that the school has to, uh, or the school district has to kick in in order to cover the debt. So I have had a conversation with John. Um, one of the ideas that I think from that Feed the Future Forward um, model that I think is possibly realistic to do before the end of the school year would be to have a fundraiser at one of our local restaurants. I think there's a, a natural connection <coughs> between an organization whose mission is to feed people and try and help the school lunch program stay solvent so it can continue to feed people. Um, so I know that he's been in contact with a PTO um, to try to chair that for us because one of the problems that we encounter is we can't as a public agency try to conduct fundraising on behalf of the, the lunch um, the 
Food Services Department clear their debt. So we are, we've reached out to the PTO of Bridge Street School to see if they would contact some local eateries in order to um, run fundraisers to help raise money that they could then donate to the school committee to help cover the debt at the end of the year. Mr. Meyer. Oh, I just want to commend the Department of Agriculture for sending out these 72 pages of superfluous information. Maybe you could send it back with a note saying, thank you, please send cash. <laughs> it's just really, I mean, it's just, it's just amazing that we're, you know, we're rolling back some of the food or, you know, thinking about rolling back some of the food standards in Washington, and we're doing fundraisers yeah. to make sure that our, that, that organizations that are feeding children are solvent. I mean, it's... Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just I would say in regards to looking at the data here too that um, there's there's a significant amount of personnel um, hours that is that are being spent here so even though we're looking at a, a debt of twelve thousand five hundred dollars we're we're paying uh, several people to keep up on these numbers doing mailings home with uh, postage and certified mail in order to try to collect some of this debt so I suspect that um, the financial burden on the district is you know significantly higher I don't know but it certainly is higher than the number that we're looking at with just unpaid meals and the last two items on the report more quickly the next one is good news again um, in case you have missed it the city has sold Fiker school and the mayor and the city council have I don't know if the votes happened yet but are we're going to be um, transferring the money from the sale of the school as well as the balance in the revolving account towards the roof replacement projects going on this summer at Leeds and Bridge Street. So the money will remain to the benefit of the school department. And the last Thank item you. is the gifts. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> My word. And we only have one gift to report on this month um, <laughs> under, <laughs> under PTO gifts. One more to add to the list. Ed, does this get us to 100000 we, we, had a, yes. we had a gift from the PTO at Ryan Road for uh, two Chromebooks. They donated the money to us so that we could purchase two Chromebooks, which had a value of just under five hundred dollars. Okay. And I think the last piece of the report is a very small personnel report for April. Um, basically, more mention of subs, and then we hired two staff members into our therapy department. The council should be taking the second readings on those two orders uh, next week. Next Thursday. Okay, so that concludes the uh, business administrator's uh, reports, and now we have the superintendent's report. Dr. Provost. Thank you. This has been a month of highs and lows for the district and for me personally. The height of our joy came early on with the excellence in teaching and person of the year ceremonies, um, which were back to back almost. So those were, uh, that was a really excellent week. But then a few short weeks later, we were faced with the unexpected passing of Phyllis Ryan, um, and that really plunged us into the depths of despair. Um, it was, I think, probably of all of the school losses I've seen the most difficult on staff and on students. Um, we were calling in support from other schools throughout the morning. Um, I, I just, I'm still, I'm still processing the event, as I know that many of the people at the school are. Um, these kinds of experiences are supposed to provide you with some perspective. From my perspective, it seems, what may have come from the last month is that the events have moved us as a district a little bit closer to the heart than the head. And that includes me, and that's big for me. <laughs> um, at any rate, I've noticed a shift in the way our staff is relating to each other and the students. I see more checking in. I see more humor. I see more listening to each other. And I think those are all good things, even though it, it was very difficult circumstances that brought us to that. Uh, it's also been a month of a lot of behind-the-scenes work that neither you or the public could know about unless I told you so. Let me give you some updates. Do you remember the conundrum of building use by other city departments and outside groups? Uh, that was another matter that was referred to the Rules and Policy Subcommittee, which after some study <coughs> referred it to me to negotiate a joint use agreement. Uh, we've had three negotiating sessions so far, and I have to confess that I caught my partner negotiators and even myself a little bit by surprise 
when I suggested using interest-based bargaining. I <laughs> suppose <laughs> I, after 70 hours, I'd just been so conditioned. <laughs> that was the only thing I could think to do. Um, but the process has been good. Um, all three sessions have been a really creative and respectful exchange of ideas. I think that we've moved forward on a number of issues. Uh, our last session, or what I hoped would be our last session, has been was scheduled for May 31st, but that was rescheduled due to a traffic hearing for one of the negotiators who has a citation from the Boston Police Department and who also has a alibi that places her in another city that night. So <laughs> my hope was to bring forward a comprehensive joint use <coughs> agreement in June. Don't think I'll be able to do that because of the um, rescheduling of that meeting, but things are going well on that and you will have something soon. So I wanted to let you know about that. Also, I want to let you know that Molly McLaughlin and Jeremy Whalen are doing some amazing behind the scenes work on the district website. One of the things that the mayor has let city departments know in our meetings is that there's um, an upcoming city website refresh. Well, ours is not going to be a refresh. Ours is going to be a complete do-over. Um, I'm usually an advocate for incremental change because it's usually the only thing that's possible. Uh, but I've been on the pre-launch website, and I can tell you this is not something that's just 5% better or 10% better. This is getting in the Millennium Falcon and popping out in another <laughs> galaxy. <laughs> and it's a galaxy that's not within the Northampton K-12 domain, so it's a good thing that the policy passed earlier this evening so we can host that site. Um, so looking forward to making that available to you and available to the public um, before too long. Also, um, as Candy referenced in her report, the financial better fortunes we've experienced in the past few weeks have um, enabled us to provide more professional development on inclusion and co-teaching this spring. We're offering a blended learning model of up to six hours for each elementary teacher. At least one and a half of the hours must be spent attending one of the two inclusion webinars presented by Lisa Deeker that will be hosted in the NHS auditorium. And then teachers can be reimbursed for up to an additional four and a half hours by completing a, a series of online activities. Um, they can select from the menu. They don't have to choose all of them. They can choose as many as they want. They can choose the ones that they think are most appropriate to their needs. Uh, but they include things such as reading selected articles, watching training videos, and reviewing the resource guide to the 2011 Massachusetts Curriculum Frameworks for Students with Disabilities. We're also re arranging site visits to Ludlow and Amherst classrooms that are already implementing co-top models. The Westfield Public Schools has also opened their uh, spring inclusion trainings to our staff, so they'll be able to attend that. Um, and of course, we've lined up Lisa Deeker and Tom Hare for our 2017-2018 PD. And it's nice um, in an era where I think a lot of times schools are set up to compete with each other. A lot of the districts that we're working with on this have said, well, you can attend our training, can we attend yours? So we're building up a little cohort of schools that are doing inclusion, and I, I think that's, that's going to be a nice support for us. Finally, uh, we received notice from NEASC that its committee voted to continue accreditation for Northampton High School. For those of you who um, may not be so familiar with the process, accreditation is a 10-year process, but five years in you have to do an update. And so this was the five-year update and um, their vote to continue accreditation based on the accomplishments of the high school. And um, things that the high school were recognized for in moving forward in the past five years included the following that I'd like to share. Establishing common learning expectations, assigning each department responsibility for three of the 11 academic and civic learning expectations, increasing funding for print and non-print library resources, developing curriculum units based on the understanding by design model and uploading them to the Atlas database, providing more time for teachers to collaborate on curriculum writing, establishing a full-time district curriculum director, hiring an associate principal of academics and curriculum, establishing a system for teachers to gather feedback from their students, increasing technology supports, developing data teams, involvement of faculty in site-based budget process, and establishing the Lens 21 program. Now, as I went through that list, I'm sure you realized that a lot of those accomplishments were actually the committee's accomplishments as well. 
a lot of those were positions that the committee agreed to fund. Um, so I just want you all to share some of the credit for that as well. Um, so the committee asked the school to continue its work on building connections between students and adults and to examine assessment practices, including school-wide grading policies. And I think these um, areas of, of improvement are areas that will really dovetail nicely with elements of the district improvement plan. So I think it's, it's all coming together really nicely at the high school. So those are things that we don't talk about all the time. Those are things that don't get a lot of press. But I wanted to make you and the, the community aware of them. And that's my report. Thank you, Dr. Provost. So we do not have any new business uh, scheduled for tonight's agenda. I will remind uh, the public that we have two upcoming uh, meetings scheduled, the Rules and Policy subcommittee, uh, subcommittee meeting of May 25th at 3.30 p.m. in the superintendent's office, and then our next regular school committee meeting on June 8th, 2017 at 7.15 p.m. here in the JFK Community Room. I would now entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Your second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? The school committee meeting is adjourned. Okay.